numerous people in my laboratory. And the ones who are here, the ones who are not out in the snow, maybe you can stand up. So Ronnie Das, Jan Dahl, Javier Figueroa, Federico Yena, Kurt Kung, Reiner Stolberg, and Adam used to be there, and Hyak Yu. So if you guys are around there, you, we have posters and such. Anyway, they're the ones who did the work. Okay, so I'd like to start uh, from a very simplistic point of view, considering water as a, a simple dipole, and if you ask the question, what happens uh, to a dipole at a charged surface, you might imagine that the, uh, the water would, or the dipole would absorb onto the surface in a situation something like this, and other dipoles might absorb onto those, and so on. If you have a lot of charges arrayed on the surface, then you might expect some kind of ordering. But the ordering is expected to give way to random chaos after a few molecular layers because of thermal motion. So the common view is that the ordering extends maybe two or three layers from the surface. What I'd like to convey to you today is that that's wrong, and that the ordering actually extends extremely far from, from the surface. And that this uh, water, this interfacial water, is extremely important for many phenomena in nature. So the initial experimental approach to figure out how far the ordering might extend, if, if we could determine that, is to uh, look for solute distribution. So the idea is that right near the surface, where you have order, you'd expect that the solutes or particles or what have you would be excluded. And they would be, because it's an ordered region, energetically speaking, it would not be favorable. But far from the surface, you'd have plenty of hydration water. So the idea was to put in some solutes or particles and see how big an exclusion zone might be if there were one. And the first experiment <coughs> used a polyvinyl alcohol gel put into a chamber and we put the water and the microspheres in. And we wanted to see whether perhaps uh, near, near the boundary, which is right here, we might find a zone of exclusion. And these are some of the first experiments. And you can see that these microspheres, we use microspheres because we can see every one of them in the microscope. So they moved away and away and away from the interface. And they stopped at roughly uh, 60 micrometers uh, from the surface. And so we thought, uh, this is really amazing because it couldn't be that uh, the, the zone could extend 60 micrometers. That's practically like infinite. So we uh, wondered and we did another experiment with a different gel to see if we got a similar result. We used a polyacrylic acid gel. And I'll just show you another video, but after 10 minutes, it looks like this. So uh, the gel at the, uh, this is the left edge of the gel here and, and the right edge here, and this is just an optical reflection. And you can see that after 10 minutes, there's a big zone here that contained no microspheres, and <laughs> same on this side. And all the microspheres were here. And you could see them dancing around and they were grounding in motion, but they would not enter this, this region. So we, we understood that this was not something particular to one gel, and that this, was, this could be really large. We're talking a quarter of a millimeter here. And we call it an exclusion zone because it excludes. The basic finding has been, been confirmed by numerous people. It was actually published 40 years ago in the Journal of Physiology. It seems to imply a very long-range kind of ordering, and if that's true, obviously you need to interpret a lot of things differently from the way you might interpret them, and so we became really interested in this. And what I want to do to get to the basis is to try to answer five questions. Is it general, or just those couple of gels? Does it really arise from the ordering of water or something else? No uh, mm -hmm. it Can no order, uh, yeah. water ordering explain various anomalies that we yes, encountered? And, mm -hmm. and you need energy to create order. So where does that energy come from? And might these findings apply uh, more broadly? So the first question is about generality. And uh, we can look at various kinds of uh, surfaces to see which ones give exclusion zones and which solutes are excluded or particles excluded. So in terms of surfaces, the first thing that you might think about is hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. And we tried various hydrophobic surfaces and also uh, and we found nothing. And we, we tried many hydrophilic surfaces and there I'll give you uh, four classes of example. We found this kind of exclusion uniformly. Uh, the first class of the four is hydrophilic gel surfaces. We tried many of them. This is a partial listing. They all show this exclusion zone. And in some cases it's bigger, in some cases smaller, but they all show it. 
we tried the biological specimens. This is a piece of muscle. You can see the microspheres uh, gathered mostly far away, although you do see some microspheres in this uh, so-called exclusion zone. We tried vascular endothelium, plant roots, et cetera, et cetera, and this is uniformly seen in the biological specimens. We tried monolayers. This is a single self-assembled monolayer on gold, functionalized in different ways. And again, you can see that right near the monolayer, one single molecular layer, there is very few microspheres, and far away there are many microspheres. And we tried polymers. And we, we use polymers very often because they're easiest. So this is a sheet of nathion. Uh, Nikolai will talk about nathion in the next uh, one, but it's basically a polymer. And, it, and uh, we take a sheet of it that's in the plane of the screen and just cut it to a convenient chain, plop it into the chamber, add the microspheres in the water, and you'll see the same thing occurring as I showed you earlier with the gem. We exclude the zone grows. And this is cut prematurely. It'll grow to 300 micrometers, 400. It depends on the time of day, and et cetera, et cetera. But some of the same sort of thing. So in terms of uh, generality, uh, numerous hydrophilic surfaces show exclusion, but not hydrophobic surfaces. Now in terms of solutes, the question is what's excluded? And, uh, First particles, I've shown you so far only particles. <laughs> and there are polystyrene microspheres, silica microspheres, red blood cells, bacteria, colloidal gold, quantum dots, and even dirt from uh, an ash from outside our laboratory. Now getting smaller than particles, uh, we, we go to molecules, and uh, a, a typical protein uh, would, would be uh, albumin, was discussed earlier. This is a time series, so you can see in the first slide there's a piece of nathion. You can see it because of fluorescence. In the second one, you add a fluorophore labeled albumin, and you can see that with time this zone of exclusion grows. So apparently the, uh, the protein seems to be excluded. Now getting even smaller than protein, we use dyes. We use uh, pH-sensitive dyes and fluorescein dyes and various other dyes to see if they're excluded as well. And here's one example. Uh, and uh, so at the bottom, at the bottom of, of the chamber is a piece of nathion that you can see down here. And of course, you can see the dye. It has all these beautiful colors that indicate differences of pH. And the point is that the main point here is that the pH-sensitive dye is excluded. And the dye is actually a collection of different molecules roughly on the order of molecular weight 100 or so. So it looks like these small molecules are also excluded. Now the, the most interesting feature is the one that I'll get back to that has not been uh, discussed and that is, uh, that I wanted to talk about, that is the, the color of the pH sensitive dye. So the red color means pH less than three. So it means there are a lot of protons there, and then fewer protons and fewer protons, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But the point is, for question one, is that many hydrophilic surfaces generate exclusion zones, and many solutes are excluded. Okay, question number two is, um, is, is this zone really physically different from bulk water, or is some, something else responsible? And um, uh, I, I chose not to go through the data uh, piece by piece because otherwise you have all the time and I can't present anything new. So I, I want to give a, just a, a, a quick line by line summary. Much of it is published, some of it is about to be published and other is ongoing. But there are seven classes of experiment. And the first step uh, using NMR or MRI shows that the exclusion zone water molecules are more constrained than the bulk water molecules. I'm sorry, I'm not going into details, but you can uh, either look look at the papers or there is a <coughs> on, on uh, YouTube you can see a lecture that shows all this stuff just check under my name and, uh, the second one is that the molecules are more stable and that is from the based on the amount of infrared radiation that's radiated from the exclusion zone compared to the bulk water uh, we found that the exclusion zone has negative charge and I'll go back to this one in a moment uh, by measuring the electrical potential, the bulk water doesn't. We found that the exclusion zone absorbs at 270 nanometers in, in the ultraviolet, and bulk water doesn't, and I'll come back to that one too. Uh, we found that it's more viscous than uh, bulk water, and we found using polarizing microscopy and birefringence that the molecules are aligned in, in this region, or ordered somehow. 
And we also found that using IR absorption, very preliminary experiments, it's really difficult to get the spectra, we're working on it, that there seems to be some difference in molecular structure from, from water. So I just want to just briefly go over two that I think are really important for what I'm going to say. The first is that, is that this zone absorbs at, in the ultraviolet at 270 nanometers. And to see that, we just used a light, and light uh, went through a slit, was incident on a cuvette that contained a, a slab of napion right here, and another slit, and a spectrophotometer. And what we can do is we can move the cuvette back and forth, so we can sample regions far from the exclusion zone and regions progressively closer to the exclusion zone. And the result is shown here. So this is wavelength, and this axis, and absorbance. And this is distance from the interface. So if you're more than 400 or 500 micrometers, that is beyond the exclusion zone, then it's pretty flat, which means it's no different from bulk water. But as you get closer and squarely into the exclusion zone, you can see that the exclusion zone absorbs very strongly at 270 nanometers. The bulk water doesn't. Uh, so that's the first. Now, the next one is that the exclusion zone has negative charge, and I just want to go over that briefly. And the way we did that experiment is to take a gel, put a gel here, this is the inside of the gel, and this is the outside of the gel. It's a polyacrylic acid gel. And we put one electrode out here, a reference electrode, and a probe electrode that was a micro electrode, a, a three molar uh, 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 potassium chloride filled glass microelectrode tapering to a sharp tip. And if we put the electrode here that is far from the interface, the potential difference between this point and the point far away here is zero, as you'd expect. But as you get closer, you begin to pick up a negative potential. But by close, I'm talking about something like 200 uh, micrometers or so, which is roughly the size of the exclusion zone for this polyacrylic acid gel. So it looks like this region that corresponds to the exclusion zone has a negative electrical potential or a negative charge. We tried it again putting napion here instead of the gel, and the result is shown here. Uh, again, the same sort of result, except the negativity begins farther from the interface. And in the case of napion, as I mentioned, the exclusion zone is bigger than it is for this gel. So it looks as though, it looks as though the exclusion zone region has negative charge. Now, at first, that doesn't make any sense at all, because uh, how could it, you just put water in there, and water is neutral, so how can you have negative charge? The only way that it might be reasonable to have a negative charge is if somewhere else you have positive charge. In other words, somehow the water molecule is splitting. So, so the negative part uh, then is, is here, and uh, the positive part here. And I see we have no color. That's OK. Um, so, so is there positive charge somewhere far away? Well, you, you might expect it here. Is there any evidence for that? And I've shown you the evidence already. I've shown you this slide, which now you can see at 90 degrees. And so you, you see the piece of napion sitting right here. Here's the exclusion zone. And I mentioned to you in the previous slide that this exclusion zone has negative charge. Now, if you look at the pH results, I said I'd be getting back to it. You can see that you have a lot of protons here. So you have negative here and positive here. So it does look as though somehow the neutral water has been split into negative and positive uh, components somehow, negative, positive. And to check to see whether that was really so, we put one electrode in here, one electrode in here, connected through a resistor to see if there was current flow. And here's the current flow as a function of time. The important feature is that although it decreases, it, it doesn't go to zero. It levels off at some value. And so it, it really does appear that there's a negative zone and a positive zone, and you can get current between those two zones. And so there really is charge separation. Uh, and, and so it looks something like this, where you've got a, a surface, you have an interface, and then you have water, and this is the exclusion zone water, and this is the bulk water beyond. So it looks as though what you have is a charged battery in water. In other words, you put a hydrophilic interface there, you have water, and then you get a charged battery. Now I know that seems weird to have a charged battery in water, However, you do another familiar example where you have water and where you have charge separation, and that's this. Uh, and the charge separation here is, obviously we're talking about 500,000 volts or something like that. So ours is much more timid than you might expect, but there is a charge separation in water. All you've got here is water, basically. Okay, so I just wanted to summarize 
all these uh, points, most of which I haven't shown you for lack of time. If you look at the ones in blue, uh, that is, the uh, exclusion zone molecules are oriented, they are stable and constrained relative to the bulk. That, that the, the easiest categorization of that is a liquid crystal. Liquid crystals have that. So tentatively, we would describe this as a, as a liquid crystal. So, so far, the summary so far is that we have a zone next to hydrophilic surfaces, and this zone looks like a liquid crystal. It has negative charge. It excludes solutes and particles. It may be non-dipolar, uh, because uh, some of the evidence that I've presented to you uh, so far, I'll get to that in a moment, and it may extend very far. So by very far, we're talking not two or three molecular layers, but two or three million molecular layers, or something like this, uh, very extensive. It was suggested many years ago uh, by Sir William Hardy that water might actually have four phases instead of three, and I'm not sure if this qualifies as uh, a fourth phase, but it's certainly different from the liquid, it's different from the solid, and exists in, uh, there's a lot of it. Now, in terms of uh, the possibility of a non-dipolar exclusion zone structure, there, there are a few suggestions that dipoles might not suffice, and I'd like to just try these ideas a bit. Uh, the first is that it, that zone, remember, has negative charge. Most, most of them have negative charge. And, Dipoles are neutral, so if you try to understand how you can get a high concentration of negative charge, whereas the dipoles are neutral, it doesn't, it, it doesn't fit exactly so well. Another is the strong 270 nanometer absorption, strong enough to saturate the, the machine. And usually uh, the people who do these measurements know that uh, ring-like structures are the ones that, uh, that absorb 270 70 or absorbed in the UV in that general range, not necessarily 270 nanometers. So, so it's a suggestion that maybe some ring-like structures may be uh, uh, more realistic. It's amenable to shear thinning. That is, if you have a surface and you have the exclusion zone building out and you impart flow in this direction, it gets thinner. So it looks like you have layers and the layers could be torn off, uh, or worn off by shear. You'd like that the structure would have some kind of precedent, something you've seen already, not something that you just picked out of, a, uh, out of uh, the clear blue sky. And so one idea is if you look for the precedent, look to ice. Now, if you look at ice, uh, you have this hexagonal uh, structure. And this is a, a model taken from uh, someone's website. Uh, it, it, the, the, these are the oxygens. And the hydrogen should be in between these. They're just omitted from here. And you can see that the layers are stacked, and you can kind of look down the stack if you like. They're not exactly, the planes are not exactly aligned. If you look from a different angle, you can see that the planes are interconnected by protons. So you have an oxygen and oxygen and a proton, and oxygen and oxygen. And oxygen. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, between these two, you have none, and you have another one, and you have none, and you have another one. So it's every other one is connected by, by, these, uh, by a proton. And so, the question is, is it possible now that, that somehow that this kind of structure could possibly describe the exclusion zone? So this is the one at the right is a solid, obviously, and we don't have a solid, we have something in between. And so the question is, if you remove the protons uh, from here, the blue protons, then you have something that's not a solid anymore. You, the, the structures are not connected to, to one another, but also You'd expect that they would fly apart because the negative charged oxygen are right next to each other and there's nothing holding it together. However, there is a way of holding it together that's, that's very simple. And that is, if you start with one layer and move the next layer rightward, as you see, so, so in other words, you, you have a nucleating surface behind here and then you have various layers building up and you take the upper level this one, and move it relative to the lower level, it would stick together by electrostatic forces when, when the hydrogens and oxygens are right in opposition to one another. It would be a weak kind of connection, easy to remove, easy to shear. So, and it turns out, uh, let's, let's go back to, to this one. Of course, if you remove the protons uh, from here, and then what was originally neutral would become negative, right? And you can actually count the charges, uh, if, you, if you go around one of these hexagons, then rather than go through it, I can tell you it's minus one. Uh, it just has too many oxygens relative to hydrogens, and it makes it a negative, negatively charged structure. 
as you can infer if you take away protons. Um, so what you've got is a structure that is actually built up uh, from some nucleating layer, and you have layer by layer by layer. Now what I've shown you here is, uh, for example, a material surface down here, and this is the first layer and the second layer, and there are obviously many more layers. So you get a layer by moving rightward, as you can see. But you don't have to move rightward, you can move uh, along this way, or you can move this way, and so on, you get the same result. So you have any, it's not just a rightward shift that gives you a stable structure, but a shift that's 60 degrees, it's 120 degrees, and so on from that. And so one of the nice features of this is that you can get a helix out of this kind of structure. You can get basically any structure you want, depending on the shift of each plane. And, and by, by shift, it has negative charge, it has the ring-like structures that absorb uh, at 270 nanometers pi electrons. It's able to accommodate helical structures of all kinds, of different pitches, uh, and, and it's partially helical or non-helical. You can get shear thinning because you can take one sheet and move it past another sheet. And a, a point I had to mention is that these sheets are practically infinite. So many people have commented on the dipole stacking model, that by the time you get to the third or fourth layer, the grounding motion would be so great that you'd have no more order. But this is not molecule by mo molecule, this is sheet by sheet. And when you have a gigantic sheet and another one, they don't exhibit much grounding motion. So the idea that the structure can't exist because of thermal motion, I think, is, it, is a long start. The problem with this is that it's similar to poly water. And some of you will remember that uh, the, uh, the polywater incident and all that. And the structure that was proposed for polywater in 1969, based on other kinds of evidence, is exactly the same structure that we're suggesting. Sorry. So the answer uh, to uh, question two, yes, it's distinct from the bulk. It's liquid crystalline and it might be a layered honeycomb structure. Okay, so. Can this water explain various counterintuitive anomalies? What do we expect from, from a crystal? See, so first thing is that you know crystals stick together. And when you think about jello, for example, gelatin dessert, and the question is, well, it's got such big pores inside, uh, how come the water doesn't just dribble out and it's something that looks like this, except in some cases the pores are so much larger and you have hydrophilic surfaces, so you're going to have this kind of a, uh, liquid crystalline structure. So the crevices are actually filled not with bulk water, but with liquid crystalline water, and that's why the water doesn't dribble out the same way as it doesn't dribble out of a cell whose membrane is cut. Now this material should be gel-like because of its liquid crystalline character, and so when you feel that it's gel-like, you can kind of understand why, why it might be, and perhaps it's due to the water. And then you ask the question, how come you can uh, look at the surface? And sometimes you can put rather heavy things on the surface and they won't sink. And you know water, of course, has surface tension that's high. But the surface tension usually is thought of as uh, being as one or two molecular layers being responsible. Yet pretty heavy things can be, uh, <coughs> can be supported. And so we have some experiments that, that show that this kind of water might grow at the air-water interface. We don't always see this, but we see this often enough. Uh, these are just microspheres suspended in water. And there are two glass plates that are sealed here. And so here is the meniscus up at the top. Here is the water and microspheres. And within 15 to 30 minutes, a clear zone appears. It's roughly a millimeter or so at the surface. So when you think clear zone, no microspheres, you think, well, you know, it might be similar to the exclusion zone. And some measurements show that there is negative electrical potential near the top surface. So that's true. And the next measurement shows that there is a, a thick gel-like band at the top. And this experiment, shown on the next slide, it's a, here you can see the microspheres in water, and here's the clear zone, here's the top, and this is a probe, and the probe is going to touch the surface and move back and forth, and you'll see that the distance from here to here doesn't really change a whole lot. It, it's cohesive, it sticks together. And that's shown here. So the probe is coming down, lifting up, and moving back and forth from one side to the other. And you can see that top clear layer it looks like a thick rubber band that sticks together no matter what the mechanical perturbation. So it's possible that the reason that water surface can support fairly heavy waves is that you have many structural layers, not just one or two, but many that perhaps are something like an exclusion zone to create the high tension. And that is maybe why you can understand this, this creature. Maybe some of you have seen this. I know some of you have. 
and which walks on water, and therefore it's called the Jesus Christ lizard, because it walks on the water. And so the question is, you know, can one or two molecular layers account for this, or is it possible that this thick layer that I've been talking about is really what's responsible? And the same thing for the water droplet. So here you have a water surface, and you have a droplet that's suspended and about to fall. So you have water on water. And of course, you always expect water on water to dissolve instantly, but it doesn't happen. And perhaps one of the reasons that I'll show you it doesn't happen is that this water is sitting out exposed to the air. So you have an air-water interface and presumably some kind of exclusion zone-like structure. And the same thing is true here, that this is exposed to the air too. And so therefore, when you drop it, uh, what happens is it sits there for a while, uh, it actually sped up quite a bit, and undergoes this uh, salsa, and, and eventually dissolves. So we have paper on that, it's about to come out this week. Uh, okay, now crystals can also be pretty stiff, and I, I'm not sure, but uh, Elmar Fuchs's experiment is coming this afternoon, and he has these fantastic experiments that show uh, that if you put uh, high voltage here and here, you get this suspended bridge made of water, and the question has always been, how come it doesn't collapse or break up or even droop very much? And the possibility is that some of the water around it is that this kind of liquid crystal and exclusion zone water. And if it's a crystal, then under certain conditions, it could be pretty stiff. It might be that that's at least partially responsible. And another point is that uh, uh, this crystalline zone keeps the protons from, or hydronium ions that are sitting out here from coming back in. You know, ordinarily, if you have plus and minus, the two should just come together and annihilate one another quickly. But that's, that, that's not what happens, because you can measure negative, positive here practically indefinitely. So the protons or hydronians are kept out of this zone. And the possibility is that they're kept out because this zone is a tightly packed crystal. It just Perhaps. doesn't allow the hydronium ions to penetrate. Uh, so the charges remain separate. Because of the so the answer to the third question is uh, yes, uh, liquid crystalline water can explain a lot of the uh, anomalies that the exclusion of and especially explains why the water battery charges remain separated. Okay, so then uh, the important question is what is it that charges this water battery? So and uh, we took us a long time to, uh, to understand, to figure it out. Uh, it turns out to be the sun. So mm -hmm. radiant energy mm -hmm. is what mm -hmm. charges uh, mm -hmm. this matter. And this first experiment uh, mm -hmm. demonstrated that was just a piece of napion and uh, the microspheres of water. And you can see the exclusion zone here and the microspheres here. Uh, it's green so because so we use green light, nothing pan, else is because the green mass is, is important. So and we took a, a, a point source of light, we shined the light on the chamber, so and sure enough, the, the region that was illuminated, the exclusion zone grew right before the force, our eyes. Then the it grew enormously, even with a weak light. So, so, a so we started to do some experiments, you can see the control case with napion and exclusion zone and the microspheres, and we illuminated five minutes. This was. This was just and beyond the visible, about one mm -hmm. micrometer of infrared radiation. And you can see that it grew, in five minutes, it grew by three times. So, of course, one idea is that it's infrared, it must heat the chamber, and therefore this is a secondary effect of heating. So we measured the temperature of all regions of the chamber at the end of the five minutes, and uh, nowhere did it rise by more than one degree. So it looks like it's a fairly direct effect. If you look at the, uh, uh, you might say, action spectrum uh, against uh, uh, wavelength, so this is the visible region of wavelength. This is the UV, and the infrared starts about here, and goes to here. So, and we measured how much expansion of the exclusion zone you get with five-minute exposure. So, for example, for a green light, shine for five minutes, it grows 60% relative to the, the control, and so on. So you can see that it, in the UV region, the visible region, there's some wavelength dependence, and the wavelength dependence con continues in the infrared region. And the most important wavelength is three micrometers. And three micrometers, some of you know, is the wavelength that's absorbed most strongly in water. So it looks like the wavelength that's absorbed most strongly is the one that builds this zone most, most powerfully. <laughs> There's a technical issue that the, uh, the intensity, we use the LEDs, the, in the intensities that we have available here are really low. If we use the same intensities here as we use here, higher intensities, obviously the curve would be higher, much higher. And so what, what that means is that 
infrared wavelengths are much more important, much more significant in building the zone than any other wavelengths, especially around three microns. So you can turn off the lights here, turn off the visible lights, and you still get very big growth. There's plenty of infrared being generated by everybody and by all the walls and such. So it looks like incident radiant energy builds the exclusion zone and separates uh, the, the charges. That's the energy that's required to build this kind of uh, border. So the answer to the important question about energy is, it looks like the exclusion zone buildup is powered by photonic energy, which orders the water, charges the water battery. So if you think about what might be going on um, on, on the surface of the Earth and elsewhere, <laughs> here's the sun, the sun hits the water, and it generates heat, and that we all know. So, so therefore, in the summer, you can swim. So what I've shown you here, and if we're right, this is a different pathway other than this, and the pathway shows that the sun hits the water, and it imparts energy, and it builds order and separates charge. So this is a kind of potential energy that exists in the water. It's different from, from the temperature increase. It's a charge separation and order, and it comes as a result of the light that hits the water. Now, the question is always, well, you know, if you have potential energy that comes to the water, how do we know this? How do you know that there's, can you show me that the water is giving off energy? And we found an experiment where we think that that's the answer. It was found by chance. It's a, a hydrophilic tube sitting in water. And the experiment was done both with a nathion tube and with a polyacrylic acid gel tube. And I'll show you uh, an example. We put microspheres in here so we could track what's going on. And the surprise that the student uh, saw is that there was constant flow through the tubes. It didn't show it in every one, but approximately two thirds or three quarters show it. So the, the water keeps going uh, all the way through. And you need energy, obviously, to drive it because it's kind of like a blood vessel. Without the heart, you wouldn't get energy, you wouldn't get uh, flow through, through the vessel. So obviously, there's got to be some kind of uh, driver. And the suggestion is it's that radiant energy that comes into the water and sets up the potential energy. That's the driver. And here's an example. So this is a nathion tube. Here's a one edge, the exclusion zone, <coughs> exclusion zone, nathion. And you can see the flow going through. And the same thing is true with the polyacrylic acid gel. Here's the gel. Here's the exclusion zone on both sides. And you can see the flow going through. In a few experiments, we found higher water on the distant one. And again, there, there's no doubt that work is, is being done. So if work is being done, then either we have a perpetual motion machine, which we mostly doubt, or if you have some energy that's coming in to drive it. And so we think this is a, uh, an example of incident radiant energy that's harvested to do work. So the energy just doesn't come in. It can do something. Uh, and we think this is evidence that it must be absorbed. So it, it's very strange to think that, except for yesterday's presentations, if you have a glass of water, everybody thinks it's an e almost equilibrium with the environment. But we had some presentations yesterday that said maybe not. And, and this seems to be evidence that I presented that it's not the case, that this water continues to receive energy all the time uh, from, from the environment. So, so that's this one. But you know, there's a similarity between these two. If you, if you take this one, uh, everybody knows that, that it's receiving energy from the environment, from the sun. It's taking that energy from the environment and changing it into useful energy that the plant uses to do whatever it needs to do, to be able to metabolize whatever. Everybody understands that. And I'm suggesting that the same is true here, that the same kind of processes are going on here as go on here. That is, the sun's energy is being received by the water, charge separation, that occurs and ordering, and this can be used to do work. And I've given you an example of the kind of work that's done. Another example of this that you need to, one needs to think about is about Brownian motion. Now, so Brownian motion, for those of you who are not familiar, you, know, you put some particles in the water and they bounce around. Where does the motion, it looks like, it looks like perpetual motion, but uh, as you know, the, the physicists understand that this is due to thermal motion as a result of the temperature. But, the suggestion here is that that's not correct. Uh, another suggestion is that energy is coming into the water, and that energy is being transduced to give you these motions. And if you happen to have a tube the right way, the motions will be constrained in one direction, and you get work. OK, so why is all of this important? I think it's possible that 
some of this can be important in sort of tying together physics, chemistry, and biology. And I want to end with several examples uh, in, involving water and light and particles to kind of bring this together with a few new examples for those who have heard this before. Uh, okay, so uh, you have a charged particle or molecule sitting in the water, and I suggested to you, if what I suggested is correct, that, that you have liquid crystalline water and a, a fair amount of it surrounding each particle or molecule or whatever. And the region around is full of protons or hydronium ions. And this is an issue because, uh, because the textbook says that's not true. The, the textbook analyzes reactions of molecules without that. It may have a few layers of water, but it has nothing like this charge separation, uh, the influence of the environment and such. So, I suggest that many of these uh, aqueous chemical reactions, in order to understand them, you need to start with this principle instead of the textbook principle. And that occurs in reactions in cells uh, as well. And that's discussed in my 2001 book. The water is absolutely central for every process that goes on inside the cell. So now if you ask a question uh, that has been asked a long time, uh, you have two particles and they're both negatively charged. Okay, you see that here. And you take these particles and you dump them into the water, not too far from each other. And they're both negatively charged. So if I were to ask you uh, what happens to the distance between the two particles, most of you would say, well, obviously they, they go apart from, from one another because they're repulsive. But actually, they come together. And this is an anomaly that's been known since the time of Langmuir, uh, you know, Irving Langmuir, for whom the journal is named, and, and Feynman also. Feynman called it light likes light. So these, are, these two are light charged, and, and they like each other, so they come together. And they, they do that. He said that light likes light because of an intermediate of unlikes. And here you can see the unlikes. And you can see where they came from as a result of the exclusion zone growth. You have all kinds of positive charges here, with many of them in between these two. So they come together and like this. And you have stability when the attractive force that is the plus attracting the minus, the plus attracting the minus, is equal to the repulsive force between these two, then they're stable. So they stop at this distance, and if you had another one, it would be here, and here, and so on, and that, those, uh, it's called a colloid crystal. Some of you may know that very well. So, now if you look up into the sky, and think about uh, the water vapor, and the water vapor, there are actually, it, droplets, uh, aerosol droplets, and they all have the same charge. And the question is, if they all have the same charge, you expect them to disperse. But actually, they come together. And so it's a bit of a puzzle. Why do they come together? And I'd like to suggest that they attract because of the light, light, light mechanism, which is powered by light that comes from just above. OK, now a special example of light, light, light. And we discussed the origin of life in DNA yesterday. But uh, step one, what's step one in the origin of life? And you might think that the uh, ancient Earth, or whatever Earth, had, had some molecules that were dispersed. And unless they come together to form some sort of mass, you have nothing. Okay? And so I'd like to suggest that step one uh, is that dispersed molecules coalesce. So you have molecules sitting in water. You have the sun's light. And they come together by the light, light, light mechanism. And the aggregate keeps growing, just like cell. It's a kind of self-assembly, but you don't need any complicated proteins or anything to organize it. It just occurs naturally, simply. It has negative charge, just like the cell. It has potential energy, like the cell. And you can even actually divide this aggregate by changing the local pH. So it's very much like the cell, all based on the like, like, like. So, so the step one, not the origin, but step one of the origin, I think, could be a light-induced aggregation of molecules, whatever molecules there, there, there were. If all that's needed is the sun's energy and molecules and water. And if it's as simple as that, then the question is, uh, is life being created continually? That is, out there today in the snow or rain when it's been a bit warmer. It's possible, I think, that, it, that the first step is occurring all the time, not just once, 2.8 billion years ago. Okay, now a couple of issues I want to address at the end, and I'd like to talk something about the vapor state, that is a, a water vapor, and the solid state. Um, and just a, a, a few words of note. So, if you look at the uh, uh, loop here, you can see actually a, a couple of them here. Uh, it wouldn't be possible to turn off the lights. No, 
Okay. It's not possible. <laughs> Is it possible to tell just a quick turn off because uh, of these patterns? You can see two of them here and they're they're roughly centimeter size. Uh, no, can't do okay. Uh, well you can okay, you can begin to see that. Let's see here. So roughly in the order of centimeter size loops, this one actually has little ones inside the big one here. So okay, so it looks like it looks like the, the, the that, that vapor that you saw, the clouds, this would transect some of those clouds and it looks like it looks like when you transect you see vapor corresponding to the scattered light, that is the light regions that you see here represent the vapor. So it looks like the vapor has some kind of structure. And when you think about it, you, you can't unless this the structure is built with droplets uh, that are bigger than the wavelength of light, you see nothing. So it means that you have huge numbers of molecules that comprise this kind of vapor. And so it looks like the vapor is ordered. It looks like it's not random or anything like that. And it looks as though it comes from some regions, but not other regions at the same time. And if you look frame by frame, you can see that the same picture persists in multiple frames, up to a second or two seconds. Meanwhile, the vapor is rising. So it means that these ring-like structures are actually tubes that go uh, up and down. So we were astonished to find this, but you can find it. And it's implicit in the cup uh, of hot water that I just showed you in the previous slide. So the question is, um, is there some corresponding structure in the water that would give rise to these kinds of uh, vapor patterns that are arising? And indeed there are. So this is the infrared camera image of the water surface. And you can see dark regions that encircle lighter regions. And, and so these are also roughly centimeter sized regions. So it looks as though what's rising are these dark regions that you see here are coming up out of the water to form the vapor. And sometimes you have small ones here. And you can imagine that if these small ones are rising, they would give rise to these spaghetti-like strands that seem to be pulled out of the water. Looking at different temperatures, you can see that uh, these are smaller at higher temperature and yet progressively bigger and a bit more stable at lower temperature. But basically, the water surface rings that you see with the infrared camera, which applies perhaps different temperatures, uh, they correspond to vapor rings. There's a continuity between the two. The vapor comes right out of the fluid. So if you think about the evaporative process, it looks like the vapor rises from the mosaic rings that you see in the water, which is different from the idea of one molecule at a time coming up. It looks like evaporation is a discrete event. It happens in one region, and then it may stop there, and it doesn't happen in any other region. You may get two of these rings together, hooked together that are coming up at the same time, but it looks like a discrete event. Now, the question is, what are these dark rings arise from? And there are a couple of possibilities, and one is that there are thermal gradients in the water. That, that's a conventional view. That's why you see these rings hot and cold. That's one interpretation. Another is that these darker regions correspond to EZ-like material. That is, perhaps nanobubbles with EZ shells or something like that stuck together. And uh, uh, I would show you that uh, one interesting observation is that you can see these patterns with visible light, over and above seeing them with infrared. If you see them with visible light, it means they arise from differences of index of refraction. Now, in order to see it, you need sizable uh, differences of index of refraction. If this came just from thermal gradients, the difference of index of refraction is trivially small. There is a change of density with temperature, but it's so small that it's difficult to think that you'd be able to see it. But if, if the exclusion zone material has a higher refractive index as the next presentation will show, then it's easy to understand how you can see these, although not as well, even with visible light, not with infrared. And you can see them also that they extend downward. It's not just a surface pattern, but this is a, an oblique view. And you can see it also uh, when you take a side view. You can see how these things, they build and disappear and build and disappear. And they're not all straight down. Uh, they kind of wave around, and some of them actually turn at 45 degrees, some even more than that. So. It looks like some kind of uh, material, and presumably an easy like material with higher refractive index, and that's why you see it. And so, if you come back to this, uh, it looks like the vapor patterns uh, come from liquid patterns, and it looks like these puffs that you see uh, here, 
Uh, you can see at home, it's really easy to see this, uh, they come from these kinds of rings or cylinders or tubes that rise up right from the solution itself. And the small ones would give rise to these streams that remain together actually for quite a long time as though you're pulling it out of the liquid. Okay, so uh, I'd like to have just uh, three slides or so uh, to show you something about the solid state, that is ice. If you remember the structure that I was suggesting to you, remember this has an ice-like uh, 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 structure. It's not ice because, because in the case of ice, which is uh, shown here, in the case of ice, the hexagons are stacked in register, okay? And in this case, they're not in register. They're shifted by one unit, so they stick together with one another. Now, in the ice structure, if you, if you want to go from the exclusion zone structure to the ice structure, all you need to do is add protons. Right? So you add protons to, to this structure, and then you get this one. But as the protons come and confer additional positive charge to, to confer neutrality from this structure, this is negative and this is neutral, it's got the protons, you notice that the faces come apart. And so we know that ice is less dense uh, than, than water, and, and certainly less dense than this kind of water. This kind of water is probably as dense as you can get. Uh, these planes are stuck together so tightly, and, and uh, Nikolai will present next the measurements of density done by, by refractive index measurements that suggest that this exclusion zone structure is a dense structure. So the point is that, the main point is that if you start with this and you add protons, you get to this. And so the uh, question is whether it's possible that you start with an exclusion zone as an intermediate between liquid water and ice, and you add protons, and you get ice. And uh, so the idea is something like this, that you have an exclusion zone with negative and positive, and you reach a threshold where the positive charges pile up so much that they exceed threshold that they rush in at once and, and take this negatively charged exclusion zone, neutralize it, and create ice by putting those protons between the different layers. Um, and just one experiment that is suggested but not conclusive, we're still debating uh, interpretations and such, and that is, uh, you have a cooled copper surface here and microspheres in water. And this is room temperature, and if you start cooling the surface and go down to a lower temperature, you can see that uh, a microsphere free zone, we don't know if it's the same as an occlusion zone, but it might be, similar to an exclusion zone, keeps growing. And it's this region that grows here that will suddenly transition into ice. So it's possible that the exclusion zone structure is actually intermediate going from bulk water to exclusion zone water and then to ice and then vice versa. So the possible freezing process is you take cool water, uh, the exclusion zone builds, charge separates, proton concentration builds to a threshold, and then the protons rush in at once into this uh, negative exclusion zone and create ice. So yeah, in other words, exclusion zone plus protons Give you, give you ice. And so I showed you that in terms of solid state of ice, it's possible that it's a, a simple transition, not from bulk water to ice, but possibly from exclusion zone water to ice. And in the vapor state, I've shown you that, that the mosaic rings that you can see in the liquid, both by infrared and visible imaging, uh, some kind of structure looks like is what creates the, the vapor. Obviously, this is some deviation from uh, conventional views, <laughs> obviously. Okay, so I think that together, you know, the exclusion zone gives us, it's really, it really provides a new background from which to begin, because now it looks as though if this is correct, if, it's, if the experiments are repeatable, and, you know, uh, that it looks like there really is something different about water at interfaces, it's vastly different from the liquid water, and it's just full of properties that can lead to so many different uh, interpretations of phenomena that have been difficult to understand. It might be that they turn out to be simpler. So I, this, as I said, it was done by a lot of people, and uh, 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 seven or eight of them are, are here now, undergraduates, students, uh, postdocs, and whatever, and, and uh, everybody trying to figure out what the water it, it, like everybody else here, is, is all about. And these people, as you speak to them, you'll know that they're really uh, deeply immersed, so to speak. Uh, okay, as this, uh, uh, so, uh, yeah. okay, anyway, thank you, and I think the interface is interesting. Yeah. And, this, and it expands, and then you have gas. 
I think that's what happens. And because it becomes a gas, it rises up. So it's hollow. It's like hollow rock. Well, each of the vesicles could be hollow, but, but the structure that I'm showing you would be a collection of vesicles, numerous vesicles giving rise to these extensive structures. Basically nanobubbles, if you will. Mm. Thank you. The, the most common way to look at structures is, uh, of course, diffraction measurements like uh, X-ray and neutron diffraction. Do you think that would be possible to, to do? I mean, uh, would it be possible to, to uh, observe this layer or is it broken uh, by, by simply doing the measurements or...? Uh, we tried and failed. We tried X-ray diffraction. It was a fairly crude and we hoped to see structure. We saw no, nothing that looked like structure, and at first we were really disappointed. But then if you think about it, the, the, um, the order is a, that is a short range order, not a long range order, because you have one plane and you have the next plane. It's shifted. The next one could be shifted the same way, but it could also be shifted this way or this way, any of 60 degrees, and so could the next plane. So you don't have a long range order that you would need to see something in, in X-ray. Also. Since the electrical potential from the surface outward, this is minus 200, minus 190, 180, and so on, it keeps changing the distance. So some aspect of, of this structure changes in this direction as well. So although it's kind of ordered, there's so much disorder that's involved that it may make it really challenging to detect, if this structure is correct, it may be challenging to detect it by X-ray diffraction. We're still hopeful. But, but I guess you expect that these differences from uh, ordinary bulk water measurements. Yeah, we expect because all, all of those seven measures that I told you also differences between bulk water. So if that's true, then there have to be some differences of, of structure or organization or something. And we ought to be able to detect that by X-ray diffraction. But as I said, you have to have enough order. And our, the beam that we used was a big beam. So if we, over a big beam that's a couple of hundred micrometers, there's so much disorder for the reasons I mentioned that it, we wouldn't really expect to pick up anything other than subtle differences. We saw some subtle differences, but they were not, they didn't really blast you in the face. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, Where are you? Oh, okay. Uh, it seems to me you didn't talk about the uh, uh, electric solution case. About what? Electric solution. Electric solution. Uh, I am. I am. I am. I am. Yeah. The uh, if uh, uh, electric uh, still ex excluded. Uh, well, uh, we don't know for sure, but we have preliminary experiments showing that salt is excluded, that salt ions are excluded uh, by collecting a fraction in the exclusion zone and a fraction beyond. Uh, we can only do it on, under very low salt uh, concentrations because as you increase the salt, the exclusion zone becomes really small. It becomes small, it's hard to measure. You see? So, the experiments are actually pretty challenging to do, but the preliminary evidence suggests that the ions are excluded. Yeah, and we also tried water. You, know, you can have a, a, a membrane and an exclusion zone, and you pour in some fresh water, and the water won't drip through the membrane. It's an osmosis membrane, so water ordinarily can go through, but it doesn't go through in a situation like that. So it looks like water is excluded from the exclusion zone. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, just a, a few comments. Uh, I think, first of all, if you have some negative charge in there, I think the most likelihood that would be in terms of OH minus species. Okay, let me answer that before your next one. So, if it's OH minus species, <coughs> the, the problem is, uh, is, is that they would repel each other, you see, and they would come apart instantly, unless you have coherent domains in which that Emilio was talking about, which is certainly a possibility. But ordinarily OH molecules, they just go all over the place. Just the way we see that the protons go all over the place in the bulk water, the, the, or hydronium water, they, they gradually diffuse all over and cover the whole area. So that's why I think it's not OH. And also, all of the, 
spectroscopic and other properties suggest that there's something really different going on there. Yeah, I, I, I didn't finish my comments. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, because what happens if you have a wedge, we know that the wedge has a tendency to put much stronger hydrogen bonds. In fact, there are three stronger hydrogen bonds between the water molecule and the wedge than what you have between the water molecule and water molecule. Oh. And uh, so, so if you if you think about my presentation yesterday, when I talked about that water can be seen as a fluctuation between low density water, which is very tetrahedral, uh, and high density water. So what we know is that the wedge uh, is has a tendency to increase the tetrahedral water, in the water. And, and we also have recent experiment which I, we have we have published yet where we see this density fluctuation generating these low density liquids seem to be enhanced, probably by OH. And uh, if you have this low density liquid also, that would actually exclude salts, because salts doesn't like to be the tetrahedral reactive system. So one possibility, and also if you have more low density liquids, you will actually have much easier to freeze that as well. So I think this could be evidence that um, that you could potentially have generated something here, high density fluctuation, generating more of this low density liquid, which also could be enhanced by the presence of OH, but the OH with hydrogen bond, would not sit next to each other, it would be immersed in the hydrogen bond. Yeah. Well, as a possibility we haven't seriously considered, but I, I think it certainly is an interesting one. Uh, one com comment on that is, I didn't tell you, because I don't want to complicate things, but under certain circumstances, we actually find a positive exclusion zone. Uh, um, so, you know, it's always con confused. We don't see that often, but next to certain kinds of services, we can see a positive. And so it seemed to me that, uh, uh, by Occam's razor, that you really need to have uh, one kind of structure that can explain both. And, and that's, I didn't say it here, but this plane of structure that I was talking about all you need to do is remove oxygen from the lattice, and if you remove every third one or second one, whatever, you go from negative to positive. So the same molecular structure can actually explain both. Now, if you start with OH minus, then in order to explain a positively charged exclusion zone, you, I think you'd need a completely different kind of, uh, of, of structure, which, which is possible, but not so nice. Last question. Thank you for your fascinating talk, Jerry. Oh, I'm sorry, where are you? Oh, right here. Thank you. Um, question I have is using the, I assume they're polystyrene or some sort of plastic microsphere, but I'm wondering what is the fabric that you use to give the imaging of the EZ zone and whether it might not be in the microsphere form interacting somehow with the bulk phase, since all of these interfaces do interact with water. Um, what is the nature of the material? What can you say about those interactions? I think it's a very important point. Uh, we did find that polystyrene microspheres themselves have exclusion zones, as you might expect, because they're hydrophilic. And uh, almost anything, or anything, that's suspended in water or dissolved in water is, is by definition hydrophilic, and it's going to build structure. So everybody thinks of the structure as hydration, but we think of it as an exclusion zone. right? And so that means the microspheres themselves should have exclusion zone. You can't test it because those might be tested only indirectly because they're so small. We tried it with bigger ones of the same material, and sure enough, you can see a very big, nice, shell-like exclusion zone that surrounds it. So it definitely, the, the microspheres themselves uh, would interact with the water and interfere with the measurement in, in some way that hopefully is in a minor way because you can reduce the concentration and get almost the same result. Change it slightly. Thank you very much, everyone, once again. <clears throat> Thank you very much.